Everybody, that song plays now, and I hear getting the band back together. I think of all of you. You are now the band. We are getting back together, everybody. And as Rick Pelton just said, let's do this. Let's do this. It's week 8,742 of this pandemic, and we are continuing to live stream. That's right. Monday through Friday, I'm bringing you the best of Broadway. Last, if you uh, watched last Friday, was it, which was... Three, three days ago, I think. Um, we had uh, Stephanie Clemens on from Hamilton and If Then, now choreographer of Fly. And, and also, did anyone tune in for her Instagram live dance class with her one-year-old? I mean, this woman is a superpower. So um, we're thrilled to have Stephanie. You can watch the replay of Stephanie uh, from last Friday on, their, on all of our replays uh, on the Facebook page. Just click the videos button. Catch up, we're on episode, Mary, not at me, 48, 49, 49 episodes. Tomorrow is number 50. We've done 50 of these things. Can you believe it? That is a lot, a lot. Oh, gosh. But we're going to keep bringing it to you. Um, actually, we're having a blast doing them, and I hope you're enjoying them as well. Uh, tonight... Um, we have another superpower for you, uh, Tony Award-winning producer of Town, Mara Isaacs is here. Um, Hadestown is not the only thing she's done, Inheritance as well. Um, she's also produced, get this, over 100 productions on Broadway, off-Broadway, in regional theaters around the country. Uh, she was the producing director at the McCarter Theater Center in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. She, a uh, fantastic, fantastic path from the nonprofit world to the commercial world and everything in between. So we're going to get with her uh, in just a few minutes. Um, I also want to welcome, we, we um, upgraded our technology today, everybody. We gave you a little upgrade. We are now streaming not only to my Facebook page, but we are now screech, screaming. Well, sometimes I get a little loud. So yes, I scream. Uh, we and my my wife and kid are away, so I can scream all I want now. It's a party over here. Um, we are now streaming to my Facebook page, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn. Who knew you could stream to LinkedIn? Mary Dina knew, and she hooked it up. The Broadway Podcast Network, and get this: we have a brand new partner as of today. A new streaming platform has hit the web, dedicated one hundred and one percent to Broadway. It's called Broadway On Demand. Boy, did they time the launch of this website right. So they have a ton of original content. They reached out and they wanted to stream these as well. So we are doing that. Go check them out. Sign up. They haven't, I don't think they've fully opened yet, but sign up. Um, I've been talking to them about doing some other stuff. They've got a lot of things uh, going on. Bandstand is there. It's a whole bunch of stuff. So go check it out. Uh, what else is going on in the news today? Well, the the choice heard round the world, CBS, you know, we're supposed to have the Tony Awards on June 7th, and and CBS has decided that, you know, we're not going to have the Tony Awards this year. Everybody knows that. So we were all like, oh, what special Tony event are we going to have? It'll be so cool. We'll have Tony Award winners live streaming. We'll do best of series. No, we're not going to have any of those, folks. We're going to have Greece. That's right. Grease. Four chords, three jokes in place of the Tony Awards. That's right. Uh, as you can see from this headline, people are PO'd, including a certain live streamer you may know. Uh, I love Grease, actually. I love it. I worked on a revival in 1993. Gulp. And uh, I actually love it. So I don't want to knock them too much. Um, and it's an interesting story about why we can't do all the things that we think we would want to do, we'd love to do. I blog about it tomorrow, so go check it out. I don't want to rant too uh, much because I have a guest 
and I, I want to be positive it up. I have a guest coming over in a few minutes. So, um, but check that out. Uh, don't forget about our Daddy Long Legs reunion. We're reuniting the cast uh, and creative team with Daddy Long Legs with Megan McGinnis and her husband, Adam Halpin. If you don't know, they start opposite each other. It was adorable. Uh, they're featured on that live stream, uh, as well as Paul Nolan, who originated the role, uh, me and the rest of the creative team as well. This can be this Thursday, the 21st at 8 p.m. Um, if you go somewhere where Mary's going to throw the link in the chat, click Get Reminder. That is the best way to know, to make sure you don't miss it. Click Get Reminder. Okay? Um, Got it? I'll even wait. Okay, I won't wait any longer. It's just rude to our guest. Let's bring on our guest, shall we? Please welcome to the live stream the Tony Award winning producer of Hades Town, Mara Isaacs. Welcome, Mara. Hello. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Well, you know, I'm here, I'm healthy. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I keep the most utterly, the, 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 the phrase that I keep uttering the most lately is, I'm doing as well as one can be in the midst of this madness. It's, I relate. It's a crazy time. I relate to that statement. So uh, where are you right now? I am at home in Princeton, New Jersey. Um where I have been since the 13th of March. Wow. So tell me what the mood is like in New Jersey. I haven't really left New York much. What's it like over there? You guys were lagging behind us just a little bit. What's it like now? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think New Jersey is very much linked to New York in terms of, you know, things were getting intense and now they seem to be leveling off and maybe improving slightly. Um, the community that I live in takes it all quite seriously. So people have been really good about their social distancing and they're wearing their masks in public. And, um, you know, it's, everyone's behaving very well here. As far as I can tell, because actually I don't go out much, so I don't really see them if they're misbehaving. But from what I understand, they're behaving. And... Tell me, I've been asking all my guests this, where were you when the virus hit the fan? Obviously, Hades Town, that big hit that it is, uh, was full on running to packed houses. Uh, tell me how you, tell me when you started to hear that something might be happening and then that ultimate moment when you had to make that decision. You know, it's funny because I can't, I'm trying to, to, I don't remember exactly when it, it really crept into my, I'm actually worried about this consciousness. I know that I had had a trip planned to California. I was supposed to fly, I think on the 14th or the 15th. And about a week before that, I canceled the trip. So at that point I knew probably traveling wasn't a good idea. You know, I was starting to make some choices um, and I think it was also in that sort of first week of March that um, we had a meeting with a company of Hades Town to talk about what precautions we wanted to take backstage. You know, when we stopped backstage visits and the company then voted and decided they were going to stop doing stage door. And I remember at moment people thought we were being quite drastic um, in some of our decision making and in hindsight of course it's like we actually didn't go far enough apparently um uh so i would probably say it was you know late february early march that i started you know it was late in the process that i really started to think oh this is actually going to hit us mm -hmm. i think even in early in if I remember, it was like early or mid-February, I, I got an email from some colleagues of mine in China because I'd been doing some work in China who asked me if I would get like the company of Hades Town maybe to to make up, you know, our hearts are with you, colleagues in China, video, we feel for you. And I think just around the time that I was making the ask to the company, I started to think, wait a minute, actually, we just might be right behind them. It might not actually be the right time to be asking people to make this video when in fact they're about to get hit. Mm. 
Yeah, you were the first show to cancel the the stage doors, right? You were really forward thinking. Well, I, I mean, it wasn't. It was the company. The company was taking it very seriously, and they, you know, they. It's a, you know, the cur. There's no social distancing at backstage at that theater. They take their health and their safety very seriously, as we all do. And um, it just seemed that it was an instinctive choice that I think they made and we fully supported. Mm -hmm. But it came from yeah. them. And have you been keeping in touch with the company? Are you guys, what, what have you been doing to keep everyone together during this time? We've done, you know, there've been a couple of, of company Zooms um, that have included not just the cast, but the band. We've included the crew, the, you know, front of house. Um, it's it's quite an extended family at that theater and around Hades Town, And we've, so we've tried to really include everybody in our gathering. Um, and then I write to everybody from time to time just to actually just give them information when it's not, it's less about socializing and more about here's what we're thinking this week. Stay tuned next time for, you know, whatever information unfolds that we can't anticipate. You've been in this business a long time and I've seen a yeah. lot of things. Is this the most frustrating thing you've ever experienced? You've got a hit Broadway musical yeah. and it's playing to packed houses and now it just can't. Yeah. It's like, I, I used this analogy the other day when I was talking to somebody, it's like having whiplash. You're going, you know, a hundred miles an hour in a really exciting direction. And then somebody throws a wall up right in front of you and you just have to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's been the feeling. And how are you getting through that? Like, how are you dealing with that both professionally and personally? I mean, this is not, I mean, I remember your podcast and you, you, it's not like you're just a widget maker. Like every, every one of the shows, I mean, all producers, like, I believe love their stuff. But yeah. what I really was taken with by our conversation and, and the time we spent together is that you love your shows. I do. Uh, I remember you telling me the moment about Hades Town, just listening to it in your car and not being able to leave your car. So how are you dealing with this personally? And then also the business side of you, how are you getting through it? Um, well, I think the answer on both is that I am both trying to take the long view and live one day at a time. So, you know, personally, I have my ups and downs like everybody does. And the days when I get kind of paralyzed with, you know, panic and days when I'm actually quite Zen and I just try to lean into those Zen days as much as, as much as I possibly can I'm doing, a, you know, a lot of walking and a lot of yoga. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, professionally, I don't know that I have a clear answer. I think that I'm trying really hard to, again, just kind of try to, you know, think about each artist, each project, each group of people that I'm working with and figure out, okay, how do I, how do I care for this seedling and make sure that, you know, while there isn't a lot of sunlight, it's still there when the sun comes back out again. Um, and it's different for each project. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm being totally candid. I don't have answers for everything. Um, mm. A lot of stuff were just, a lot, I have a lot of things in development, which is good because this development, some development can continue while we can't gather. Some development has to wait until we can gather to continue. Um, so I'm trying to keep the thing, moving things forward that I can move forward. Um, rescheduling all the things that got canceled or are going to get canceled. Um, and just, you know, not wallow in it too much. Mm -hmm. Are you doing Zoom readings or what are some of the other things you're doing to keep the development engines running? So we're doing Zoom kind of meetings and work sessions. We're not trying to recreate at least so far anyway, in the projects that are in development, uh, you know, for the things that I'm working on, many of which have music, so that makes Zoom readings a little bit more difficult um, because of the latency factor. Um, we do kind of work sessions where we're kind of working through things together as a group, either as a, as a thinking group or with some experimentation, then people go off and do things and send them around, and then we get together and we talk about them again. 
Um, that seems to be the most productive of way of actually making work. And I, of course, I say this not being the one who's actually making the work, but they're making the work. Um, and then I have a couple of projects, not on the Broadway landscape, but in more of the experimental sector of the things that I do that have figured out how to pivot in this moment mm -hmm. and, and repurpose like a, at a kind of community-based performance piece that was supposed to be part of a festival in June that went from being a in-person community-based piece to a virtual community-based piece. Um, and they figured out how to, how to repurpose themselves. And then the Octopus Theatricals team is, you know, supporting all of the completely different kind of infrastructure that they need in order to make that project happen. Um, and then we're thinking of another artist who we've got a, a piece that we tour with her. It's a solo performance piece. And, you know, we're looking at, all right, so if we're not going to tour this piece for a year, what are some other formats that we might be able to tell a story? Do we serialize it? Do we turn it into a podcast? And so we're, we're trying to figure out what's the, what forms are available that meet the work as opposed to just throwing work up into this form without really having thought through how they interact. So we're taking our time, we're not rushing into it, but we're cooking up a few things. I, this, I, what I love about you is you, you work in so many different mediums, uh, including, by the way, um, you know, I one of the, my favorite things to do now in this live stream is try to find the most interesting, unique little detail about someone's career and then throw it at them. And you uh -huh. work on like the most perfectly social distance show of all time. <laughs> Right. I know where you're going. Yep. Tell everyone one of the projects that on your resume that you produced. I, I feel am, like it should I be am, a rival. Speaking of theater for one. I am I am speaking of theater for one. How could I? How and could it's I, funny, funny you should bring that up because please, I cannot please. tell you how many people have come to us, to us recently and been like, this is the moment for theater for one. Um, so for people who don't know, theater for one is a mobile venue designed by Christine Jones and a firm called Low Tech Architects that is specifically made for one performer and one audience member at a time. And in the pre-COVID world, the thing that we actually celebrated most, well, there are many things about Theater for One that we celebrated, but one of the, to me, one of the most interesting aspects of it is the intimacy that it creates between the performer and the audience member, that it's not a one-way performance, that there's that the audience member is actually on the spot as much as the performer is, because how you know the performer is really feeding off of them. And it's a really powerful experience if you're in that booth. So we are actually looking at what does it mean to perform theater for one in this COVID world, both law, both in in its for like. Do we redesign the booth so that the people are, you know, at least six feet apart? Is there some kind of barrier between them? You know, we can sanitize the booth in between performances. So we are actively exploring all of those options and then figuring out at what point in the evolution of activity in the outside world, will it be appropriate to introduce that? And is that a way to kind of get people back into this idea of the live theatrical experience. And we are in the process of exploring a digital version of it, mm. which I won't say too much about now, but hopefully we'll be able to talk about it soon. It's fascinating. I mean, these are, this is the interesting thing about time. It creates opportunities for some right. things uh, because that should be able to come back before anything else, for sure. Yeah. What's the long lasting impact of this, do you think, on how theater is made? Like, what, is it, what does it look like 10 years from now that we go, oh, that looks that way because we went through this thing 10 years ago and mm -hmm. it impacted how we create this stuff or how we see this stuff? Well, the optimist in me <clears throat> says, that what happens as a result of this is less about how it's made and more about what is made. That 
I believe, and again, this is the optimist in me, um, that this time apart is only going to make people crave the live experience mm -hmm. more. So I feel I, 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 quite sure that when we come back, we will come back with a roar. Um, I also think this time has made people um, see the world a little bit more clearly, mm -hmm. see the inequities that are out there, um, see some of the practices in all kinds of industries, certainly the performing arts is not an exception, um, in which perhaps there is room for improvement in terms of how, who's in the, who's in the position to decide what gets made uh -huh. um, and who's making it. And so it is my hope that in the post COVID world, we're seeing work that matters, that galvanizes audiences, makes them really excited and know that their time in the theater matters. Um, and it can matter because it brings joy, right? It does, it does not, I'm not saying everything has to be political. But, I, but it has to be, you know, I think, I think a lot of people have gotten away with theater as commodity as opposed to theater as essential. Hmm. And I think the word essential has come to mean many different things to us in this moment. Yeah. And I guess what I'm hoping, and I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this and thinking this through live, so this will all evolve. But I guess what I'm hoping is that we're going to see work that that the people people who are making it understand their responsibility in what it is they're delivering to an audience because an audience now is taking a different kind of responsibility in coming to the theater. So that's yeah, it, it it it's going to take an extra some more dedication for that person to leave their house and go gather with a thousand people. They're going to have other things on their mind. Right. It can't be superfluous, right? Right. It's it's gotta be it's gotta be an experience that can't be matched anywhere else. So what you're saying is no more Greece. There will be no more Greece productions. There will be no more. <laughs> well, you know, maybe you know it's possible some brilliant artist could come along and do an interpretation of Greece that would make us all want to be in the theater. Well, maybe Grease 2. Maybe. Grease 2 they could do. Like yeah. that I would see. I yeah. produced it actually. I tried yeah. to get the rights of it about 20 years ago. But that's a whole other crazy story. I think yeah. The point, yeah, is that is just that um yeah, that I think Yeah, well anyway, I've made my point. Let me ask you the question that when people ask me, I'm like, I can't believe you asked me that question right now. But okay. So let me just turn it to you, which I'm sure you'll know what this is as well. When do you think we're we're lighting the lights back on Broadway again? When do you think those curtains are going up? I mean, obviously, I have no way of knowing or controlling it. Um, you know, there was some good news that came out this morning about a, a vaccine development. So suddenly, I'm like, oh, oh. huh? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, I'm nervous about saying anything publicly for all the reasons because I don't actually have any information. Um, and there are so many variables outside of my control. But realistically, I think it's gonna be a while. And I think we have to be prepared for to ride this out for a long while. If you had a choice of, like forget the actual timeline right now. Mm -hmm. If you had a choice of going back tomorrow, and it was okay to go back tomorrow with social distancing rules in place. So three seats between each party, uh, masks in the audience, that kind of thing, or to wait for six months and you could go back as it was, which would you choose? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna answer your question exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna say that it, it depends on the context. So if we're talking about a Broadway musical in a small to medium sized house, Hadestown. Mm -hmm. Hadestown. Um, I have looked really hard at social distancing um, because I am motivated to find a way for people to safely get back to work and for audiences to safely come back to the theater. And I haven't cracked it. However, 
I can see a world where smaller shows in in different kinds of venues could perform socially distanced. So I actually think there's a way to stagger a way back, which might include some socially distanced performances where the material and the venue lend themselves to doing so safely. Um, and then I think there are a lot of shows that would be better off waiting. Hmm. There's probably a whole niche career for directors that are social distance directors. <laughs> they, can, they can direct Little Shop of Horrors where the people never get the it. opposite of the intimacy director. Now yeah, we're going exactly. to distancing directors. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love it. Um, tell us a little bit more about what um, what other, can you talk a little bit more about the other shows specifically that you're working on right now? I could talk about some of them. Um, so as you know, the, the things I do run the gamut. Um, but I'm working on a show I'm very excited about that was actually in rehearsal. Um, uh, actually, the day before it was supposed to go into tech at the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, which, um, where they were going to have a first production um, of a beautiful piece called Dreamings and Zile by a performer named Somi, who comes from the jazz, you know, live music world. Um, and I guess I seem to be attracted to these women who come from the music world who decide to write their first pieces of theater. Somi is one of those. It's um, I, I keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's about where the similarity ends. She's a phenomenon as a performer. And she's written this gorgeous piece that is a, a sort of tribute to and retelling of um, the life of Miriam Makiba, who was an amazing South African singer and activist who in in the years of my upbringing was um you know very present um in certain circles in the u.s and there's a lot of people in the u.s who've never heard of her and don't know who she is um but she's a singular artist and and her story is being told by somi who is also a singular artist um and it's uh directed by liliana blaine cruz and was getting ready to have a beautiful world premiere at the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. And then this happened. So we've just literally hit the pause button and are working on when we're gonna pull it back together and get it back up on its feet again. Um, but that's one of the things that I'm developing that I'm extremely passionate about. And I just can't wait to introduce it to the whole world. Well, that brings up an interesting point because that St. Louis should come back before New York, strangely, as will the road, right? And you have a tour of Hades Town that is currently set to go out in the fall? In October, yeah. How, how do you think the road is gonna, I mean, I guess this is the same question. I'm gonna get you to answer one of these questions somehow. I mean, obviously I'm very bad at this. No one ever answers my questions. But um, what do you think about the road? What well, do you think about the road? You talk to 10 people, you're going to get 10 different opinions. About 50. Okay, so you're going to get 50 different opinions. You know, the road is, I mean, the irony is the road is not a singular thing, right? right? You've got lots of different presenters in lots of different states who are, who are experiencing this pandemic in different ways, some of whom are quite um, cautious about even thinking about programming in the fall, some of whom are absolutely determined to be programming in the fall. And so how we navigate our tour and our route and what's safe for the performers is all stuff that is very much under uh, you know, a microscope. And we are trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. Are you hearing from the markets uh, like positive, like we, we want you back, our audience like wants you, like they want to come back, they want to be here? So the thing I've actually heard, which has been really encouraging, is that many of these roadhouses are not-for-profit organizations or for-profit organizations, but with subscriptions. And a lot of them are reporting that their renewal rates are actually quite high for next season mm -hmm. because I think the audiences are trying to send a signal of we value you, we support you, we want you to be up and open in our community, and we will come back when you are there. So I feel quite good about the prospects for the road once it is safe to actually be both performing and attending shows in those places. 
Well, that goes to your point, uh, which I totally agree with, that when we come back, it's going to come back. It's a V-shaped recovery, in my opinion. It's not It's not a slow climb. When when we bounce at the bottom and then come up, we're going to... The bottom of the V might look like this. <laughs> it's really not a V. It's so, a pocket. It's more like a touchdown. <laughs> You know, touchdown so recovery. Oh, you just coined oh, that phrase. I love it. Um, I, well, I love your passion for the arts, and I love your positivity. Any any tips for all the theater makers out there, producers, writers, directors, trying to get through the day, trying to keep their shows going during this dark time? You're doing obviously a very good job at it. I mean, I do think it's I, I it's, it's real. You know, it's. <clears throat> I was in another conversation I was having earlier today, we were talking about the sort of dichotomy between the fact that I, I'm gonna speak personally now, prior to this shutdown, I was operating at a pace that was not sustainable. So I have found this time as stressful and traumatic as it is to also be a little bit restorative. Mm. And so that's just for me. And that's just a reflection of like what was happening before the crisis and then what the crisis forced me to reckon with. Um, and, but as a result, I'm sort of very aware of the fact that I'm holding kind of healing and restoration in one hand and trauma and crisis in the other hand. And every day, it's really just about kind of balancing these things and not letting, and, and really just not trying to let the trauma and the crisis overwhelm the healing and the restoration that's happening. Um, and that's a hard thing to do when you're, when you're also thinking about, well, how, you know, how am I going to pay my next rent bill or, you know, and you know, the, the, advice I guess I have for people is to not worry so much about the future that you don't actually take advantage of the present moment because the present moment actually does have something to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to be flip or glib about like the real economic hardship because that's real. Um, and, you know, we joke in my, in my family, but this is actually true, that my 17-year-old daughter is the only person who's making any money in my family right now. <laughs> you know, so. Is she, is she, what does she do? Is she uh, streaming on Twitch or something? Like all the TV <laughs> you're doing? She's, she's tutoring a um, younger kid, a younger child whose parents need to work full time and can't really do the homeschooling that is required Wow. for, you know, a seven-year-old. Um, and so she spends two to three hours a day on Zoom helping this young child through all of her homework assignments and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, that's what's, that's what's happening in my household. Yeah, I'm being creative about how to... How I to love it. I, I may just uh, end this live stream and then just go post an ad to see if I can hear somebody in something. <laughs> Although I don't remember anything right. about anything. Yeah. Uh, fractions, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I guess the first grade curriculum you might be able to handle. Yeah. <laughs> don't be so sure, Mara. Don't be so sure. <laughs> I got theater. That's about it. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, tonight and inspiring everyone out there. It's great to see you. And I look forward to seeing you again in person very soon. I hope soon. Me too. And I hope your show gets back up very fast because I'm a big fan. As we have lots of big fans here tonight. Okay. It will, it will, and go all over the world, I am sure. Thank you so much. Really appreciate Take care it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Mara Isaacs, everybody. I love her career because she does such unique stuff. She has such passion for all of her shows. Uh, I know we have a bunch of Hades Town uh, folks here. Look at uh, – there's – Mia is a big fan of the show. Uh, so go back, go back. Uh, as soon as those curtains uh, go back up, be, because can you imagine, I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again, because about Town specifically, can you imagine being in that house the first night when the curtain goes up again? I mean, that is gonna be one heck of an ovation. So when you can get tickets again, uh, go. You actually can now, I think, but I wouldn't get it for like September. You know, we're right after Labor Day. I just push it just a little bit later. Um, but do go back and see. Uh, oh, we'll put that up too. Sorry. Uh, to learn more about Myers Project, visit her company's website at octopustheatricals.com backslash projects. 
uh, that link from Mary. Uh, and that's it for tonight. Tomorrow, um, this is like um, the business of Broadway week. If it's like Shark Week, but about business of Broadway. So it's like Broadway Shark Week. Tomorrow, uh, the artistic director of Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater in Atlanta, Jamil Jude. He's a director, he's a producer, he's a playwright, he does it all. He's going to tell us um, about the regional theater response and in Georgia. In Georgia, you know, where they, they've been like throwing block parties and doing all stuff for like the last four months because they got that governor down there just like, let's have a party. So um, you can get your hair cut in Georgia. Uh, so tomorrow, Jamil Jude, uh, don't forget about all the replays. Um, you can check out all those. And um, Mary, can you throw up uh, who, every time I say that, I think I'm telling you to vomit. Mary, can you, throw, can you vomit up the list of all the guests for the coming week? Can you show us that quickly? Great. Oh, look at this. More Tony winners. Robin Goodman, producer of Avenue Q, my partner on Alter Boys. Adrian Brian Brown, super press rep to all the big shows. Michael Mayer, director of my upcoming Neil Diamond project. Tara Rubin, casting. Lynn Ahrens, uh, lyricist. Anna Luizos, Steph McEnough. Look at Michael Greif, dear Evan Hansen, director. I mean, it, this is a chock full of some folks that are going to school you all about the business of Broadway and how they're getting to it, uh, getting through this and how they're creating during this time. So tune in for all that. Don't forget, we are here for the Actors Fund. So if you enjoyed tonight or any of the episodes, throw a little change into the Actors Fund purse, which is on my Facebook page, or just go to their website and do that for them. They are doing uh, hero's work right now helping a lot of folks out there. Okay, let's get to the something to make you smile. We end every single episode with something to make you smile. So this is, this like warms my heart on so many levels. Uh, one, I'm a recent dad, and this is about a daddy-daughter singing duo called the Shaws. So daddy-daughter warms my heart, number one. Number two, the song is just sweet. Uh, and it also warms my entrepreneurial heart. Because get this, the day the virus hit the fan, as I like to say, this daddy-daughter duo in Utah who had never posted on YouTube before decided to sing a song together called The Prayer. 6.5 million views later, they have now posted about 12 songs and they've racked up 23 million views. And by the way, a couple of the songs they did, they did some show tunes. So there's another way they warm my heart. They did a couple of Andrew Lloyd Webber tunes as well. So I'm going to tell him that I told him, told him to do that. But, you know, uh, go to theproducersperspective.com backslash smile. Watch this. It will seriously warm your heart. Uh, and they've got 400,000 YouTube subscribers as well. Uh, subscribe to them. Throw them a little love. Um, they will warm your heart throughout this whole thing. It's just adorable watch, and they're they're really good. So go check that out and tune in with us tomorrow. We got Jamil Jude, and all week we got lots of amazing people, and we'll just keep giving them to you until this thing is done. I'm done. See you tomorrow. We're getting the band back together. We're getting the boys